Greetings. Uh, I'd like to talk to you now about one of the most important uh, peace innovations in the world. The prevailing term for it is unarmed civilian peacekeeping, uh, UCP. Uh, it was also known as third party nonviolent intervention. And before that, it was known as peace teams. And we still sometimes refer to the groups that go out to do this kind of interventionary work as peace teams. And where do peace teams come from? Well, uh, when I started talking about this uh, at uh, UN and other meetings uh, back in the early 90s, I used to say that we can take it back as far as the Buddha, who notoriously stopped a war from happening between two rival, rival uh, kings by holding up some water and saying to his followers or some of the people who were almost about to do this killing, what is more precious, blood or water? Because they were fighting over water rights, which should sound somewhat familiar to us today. Which is more precious, blood or water? They said, blood is much more precious, blessed one. So he said, let us not spill what is more precious for what is less. And he intervened in other ways. And there was a Chinese philosopher called Mo Tzu, who used to do this almost uh, for his whole life, going around stopping fights between rival kingdoms. So I said it goes back that far, but recently I've learned it goes back much farther. Uh, Phineas the Chimp is a famous chimpanzee that was studied by Franz de Waal. He was the alpha male of his pack, and when he got to be kind of too old to be alpha male, he was 40, which is too old for a chimp. Um, he said, well, what am I going to do for the rest of my life? And like President Jimmy Carter, he decided he would go into uh, peace work. And so what he did was when uh, chimps were getting ready to tear at one another, which could be very damaging, he would bristle up and stand in between them until the screaming stopped and everybody calmed down. And remarkably enough, he would do this even if one of the two chimps was his favorite and was stronger and was likely to win, Phineas was more interested in peace than having his side winning. And those of you who have been involved in peace teams will really smile at this because one of the important principles that we uh, hold very important for our work is called nonpartisanship. You cannot be a third party if you are more aligned with one party than the other. So uh, at, like any parent or any schoolyard monitor can tell you that this is actually an innate human capacity to involve yourself in conflicts and bring them down. Now, as we come down to the modern world, there's an interesting episode that plays an important role in the history of peace teams. In 1931, to be exact, September 18th, 1931, the Japanese invaded Manchuria after the so-called Mukden incident. And uh, fearing that this could lead to world war correctly, an Episcopal minister in the UK, his name was Maud Royden, uh, decided that uh, thousands of people should go to Manchuria and interpose themselves. She didn't use the word yet interpose themselves between the Japanese and the Manchurian Chinese armies. Interestingly enough, this was about nine months after Gandhi had been in London for the Roundtable Conference. Uh, actually, it was the second Roundtable Conference Gandhi was in, and it was probably still going on. Now, of course, it's difficult to call into being an organization of that scale from absolutely nothing. By the time people had signed up for it in any numbers, the war had spread out over a wide area, and uh, it was not possible. And some of the Indians who were with Gandhi said to her, you are trying to use a weapon which you do not yet have. But it shows you that this idea of creating not just an individual spontaneous intervention, but a systematic institutionalized intervention has a tremendous possibility and a tremendous power. And some believe, myself among them, that this really could be the way to end the war system. People wage war when they don't have an alternative, or they don't know that they have an alternative. Building peace teams up to the point where they can understand that there is an alternative might, easily, might make it much easier, at least, for people to renounce war, which is a deeply held value in the United Nations and in the heart of every person. 
And although he was primarily concerned with the decolonization of his own country and the breaking down of the colonial era, rather than with the war system per se, Gandhi did play an extremely important role in the development of modern peace teams. In fact, the term peace teams and peace army goes back to him. Shanti Sena means peace army. And Gandhi wanted there to be a group of volunteers who would live in every community and who would carry out what we now call a constructive program when there was no conflict at hand. And when conflict broke out, they were to do good offices to de-escalate the conflict. And if none of that worked, for example, the rumor abatement and carrying messages back and forth, if none of that worked, setting up mediations, if that didn't work, then they were to be willing to interpose themselves. Then, believe it or not, this has a very powerful effect. And in terms of getting yourself killed, it's not really nearly as dangerous as trying to defend yourself with a weapon. And in my own observation on my campus when I was teaching at the University of California in the 70s, students who were very upset about the ROTC, the uh, re re military training, and they wanted it off campus. ROTC was in a little building called Callahan Hall. So these students marched on Callahan Hall, and they were going to you know, throw rocks at it and so forth. Inside Callahan Hall were uh, recruits with rifles, and it looked like it could be pretty grim. But there was something called the Campus Peace Union, I think is what they call themselves. It came into existence shortly before and disappeared shortly after. And what they did was they suddenly materialized. They appeared between these two forces and said, look, if you throw those stones, they said to the students, you're going to hit us. And unwilling to do that, the students went back and the conflict was resolved. Now, of course, they should have followed that up with real, you know, con conversations between the and, and the rest of it. But in terms of just a spontaneous intervention, it was remarkably effective. Now, unfortunately, Gandhi was assassinated the very evening before he was to go to a big meeting to start the Shanti Sena in India. It did nonetheless start, and it was led by very prominent Gandhians like Narayan Desai and Jayaprakash Narayan, and it had limited successes uh, in the Goan uh, decolonization, which happened shortly after independence of India, and against the Chinese border incursion of 1962. Limited successes, but uh, not enough to inspire them to really keep going, so the idea more or less subsided on Indian soil. Uh, I'm actually going to be going to a meeting shortly to see if it can be reinvigorated. But um, then in the rest of the world, the idea lived on. In 1981, on Grindstone Island in Canada, a group met which uh, led to the formation of what became one of the most important intervention organizations that does cross-border work in uh, South America and many other places, Sri Lanka, uh, Peace Brigades International. Shortly after that, there was a book by a friend of mine, Charlie Walker, called The World Peace Guard, which uh, called for an unarmed agency for peacekeeping, which should be a, a worldwide institution. And that was in 1983. And then in 1993, came from Sister Evelyn Jagan a uh, report on a global peace consultation. While these consultations were planned and argued for, many other organizations actually started to do this work. Interestingly enough, some of them were explicitly religious or based religion-based, like Christian peacemaker teams, uh, Jewish Peace Fellowship, Buddhist Peace Fellowship, Muslim Peace Fellowship, under the aegis of the Fellowship of Reconciliation, those last three, uh, and Witness for Peace. And some of them ha were nominally secular, like Peace Brigades International. In my view, they were, they were equally religious. If you are sacrificing, risking your life for the well-being of another person, you have the same spiritual motivation. 
whether you affiliate yourself with a sectarian group or not. These groups had a great deal of success in one way and not much success in another. They were incredibly successful in the field, particularly in developing what became the specialty of Peace Brigades International, which was a protective accompaniment. In one case in particular, uh, in Guatemala, there was a group called the Grupo de Apoyo Mutual, the Group for Mutual Support, and there, which is a human rights group. And incidentally, I think that modern peace team work comes from a kind of confluence of humanitarian intervention leading to the idea that borders are not sacrosanct and uh, human rights work. So uh, the, the, what they did was call upon Peace Brigades International to send people to accompany them. A PBI would have a person accompany a threatened human rights worker 24-7, round the clock, go to work with them, go home with them. No one who was directly being accompanied by a person carrying out protective accompaniment has ever been abducted or killed. A few have been taken when our back was turned, so to speak. But in the case of this uh, group in Guatemala, it enabled that group to survive, and that eventually led to some kind of peace process in that country. So what you have is a, f a small group of people using very modest resources. What you have is a small group of people who are trained but not armed, who know something about nonviolence, and who uh, are willing to go as a nonpartisan interventionary force, have carried out tremendously successful small scale work. Nonviolent Peace Force, for example, has been incredibly successful in rescuing child soldiers who had been abducted. This was in Sri Lanka. Who, as I said, they weren't universally successful. Where they have not been successful yet is in attracting the attention of the public and showing people what an incredible potentiality this kind of courage and sacrifice and this kind of organizational work can have. Now, let me go back a little bit if we want to really talk about the potential of peace teams. Gandhi had a close associate, a devout Muslim, whose name was Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, otherwise known as Bajra Khan or King Khan. And in the, his role in the freedom struggle leading to the independence of India was to collect an army of what they called servants of God, Khudai Khidmatgars. Now, the servants of God, they were, uh, had uniforms, they were uh, very obedient to their ruler. They were drilled, but they were not armed. And they were dedicated to principles of nonviolence. They took out a very strong pledge, one of the strongest nonviolent pledges in the world. They were a few hundred in number until they were brutally massacred at the Kisakani Bazaar again in 1931. Seems to be a pivotal year for its development. After that massacre, their numbers swelled to 80,000. This is called sometimes the a paradox of repression, where the more you repress people, the, the more they revive. And uh, what this shows us is there is absolutely no inherent reason that we could not take peace teams to scale. There is no reason why we couldn't have enough resources to have rapid response teams which would go into an area when, where conflict is flaring up and do interposition if necessary and prior to interposition doing rumor abatement and doing the other things that peace teams have gotten to be so good at doing. Now as we enter the 21st century, peace team developments pick up speed, which is very gratifying. And this happens on at least two fronts. There are domestic peace teams working in the U.S., for example, and this is in a way a return to Gandhi's original vision for the Shanti Sena, which, if you remember, was to be community-based. Domestic teams are again of two types. You have civilian-based, nonviolent, unarmed, vigilante-type groups working in neighborhoods in American cities where gun violence has become a way of life, or rather a way of death. 
like uh, New York's guardian angels that uh, protect passengers on the subway systems and Chicago's interrupters, who were the subject of a very moving documentary recently. A man was murdered overnight on Chicago's south side. Police say it happened execution style. I'm fed up. 124 people have been killed. Each and every one of you all can be due right here. There are three bullet holes in his home fired by We got a responsibility to bring up our community to be vibrant. He died last Friday, shot in the back as he tried to shoot my brothers. And then beyond that vigilante type, there are unarmed civilian peacekeeping teams who are uh, permanent teams that make themselves available to keep peace at volatile events like a gay pride parade or a Ku Klux Klan rally. And here at the Meta Center, we're collaborating in the creation of a Shanti Sena network to help groups like this get started across the U.S. and Canada. Both these types uh, have in common that, of course, they carry no weapons, they have no government support, they're completely civilian society groups. But hopefully they have some nonviolence training and usually some distinctive clothing just so that you can see they are third parties when a conflict is imminent or has erupted. And these groups have been so effective that the police have been known to rely on them. For example, uh, in Michigan. So that's the domestic side. A decisive breakthrough in the global development of these international peace teams came in 1999. It was 18 years after the Grindstone Island Conference that I mentioned, when two US peace activists Mel Duncan from Minnesota and David Hartso of San Francisco happened to meet at the second Hague Appeal for Peace Conference and discovered that they had a common dream, a world peace guard taking the models of Peace Brigades International and other peace team organizations to, to scale, making it a worldwide resource for the keeping of peace. In a series of consultations, they decided that their first move should be to survey the history of peace teams and get a good sense of the best practices and the dangers to be avoided. Eventually, the idea emerged of creating a standing peace army of some 2,000 trained interveners who would come from all over the world and be on tap to go into action for the protection of human life and prevention of violence wherever they were called upon by at least one party to a conflict. That goal has not quite been reached. But at an international convening event held in Surajkund, India in 2002, the Nonviolent Peace Force was launched. At that time already, more than 16 countries asked them to please come and intervene in their region, which was far beyond their capacity at that time. And Hard choices had to be made of whom to help. The first major deployment was to Sri Lanka. It was to last nine years from 2002 to 2011. In that course of time, nonviolent Peace Force field teams made possible the rescue of dozens of children who had been abducted by the Tamil Tigers to become child soldiers. They did this by accompanying their mothers to the camp where they had been taken. And since then, NP, with its world headquarters in Brussels, has fielded teams to Mindanao, the South Caucasus, and the South Sudan, in other words, among the most dangerous conflicts in the world. There have been occasions when other international groups have deemed it too dangerous to stay in the field, but NP has kept its people there. In Mindanao, after helping villagers return to or remain in their homes and winning the confidence of all sides in this long-standing conflict, by helping villagers return, what they were doing was carrying on one aspect of international peacekeeping, which was called nonviolent protection, uh, nonviolent accompaniment, and actually took place in 1974 with the original Shanti Sena that carried out what was called the Cyprus Resettlement Project. Uh, building on all of this background, NP was able to play a significant role in brokering a peace agreement that brought the possibility of more permanent peace to this 35-year conflict in Mindanao. 
Today, they are protecting children in refugee camps in the South Sudan, uh, another case of protective prisons or protective accompaniment. At the same time, they work closely with local groups to foster dialogue among the parties to any conflict. And they've encouraged the, and supported the creation of local women's peace teams. They also do trainings for and work closely with the United Nations. Back in the 90s, when NP was just a gleam in the eyes of Mel Duncan and David Hartso, John Paul Lederach, the Mennonite theologian, did a calculation and shared his findings during a conference on peace teams that was held at the United States Institute of Peace. And he showed that a nonviolent peace force of this kind could be preventing wars all over the planet for less than 3% of the world's military expenditures. The only thing necessary for that to happen is for people to understand the power of nonviolence, its applicability in this domain, and the fact that there are thousands of people who are willing to take this risk to bring peace to the world. Let's hope that with the good offices of the United Nations and other world organizations, we may be able to change the perception of people so they do understand the incredible power of this work and that people are willing to risk themselves to do it, even though, in fact, they're, they're far less at risk than military peacekeepers are. And that this gets recognized and supported the world over. And if and when that happens, I believe that we could be rapidly on the path to a true, meaningful, global peace. Thank you very much.